This material is based upon work assisted by a grant from the Department of the Interior, National Park Service. Any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this material are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of the Interior. This project is also partially funded by the Cumberland County Board of Chosen Freeholders through the Cumberland County Cultural and Heritage Commission. All right, good evening everyone. We're gonna get started and I wanna thank everyone for coming tonight. Uh, this is an exciting project and we wanna to try to relay to you everything that we've discovered so far and what we're planning on doing over the next year. I do want to acknowledge we have a couple of freeholders here tonight. If you could stand up, we have freeholder Tom Shepard and freeholder Jim Sorrow right there. And then I also just want to acknowledge uh, our Cultural and Heritage Commission members here tonight. And that would include Suzanne Marigi, Ella Boykin, Maria Serda Moreno, Penny Watson, Merle Silver. Am I missing anyone? I don't think so. So that if you could just stand up for a sec for everyone to see, this is the Cultural and Heritage Commission. I am Matt Pizarski. Uh, I'm Assistant Planning Director for Cumberland County and uh, the Cultural Heritage Commission is administering this project. And um, so, we have several staff members from Hunter Research here tonight and Dr. Richard Hunter will be giving a presentation as soon as I'm done with mine. I wanted to just briefly go over what has been done so far and how we got to this point and then Richard will discuss the documentary research has been completed and then what is planned at the site. And I'll leave all of that technical stuff to him. Um, but if we want to go to the next slide. So first, this project uh, has, is funded through a couple of different ways. Um, the County of Cumberland received a National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program grant uh, last year. Uh, and that is funding the majority of uh, the archaeology. Uh, this program and project is also being funded through the Cumberland County Board of Chosen Freeholders. And we did seek grant funding from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities um, to cover the interpretation of the site. However, we have not heard on the results of that grant, so I have a maybe there. Um, I. I think we're going to get it, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Next slide. So I wanted to pro provide a timeline of what's happened so far. Uh, first, the Cultural and Heritage Commission uh, identified the Battle of Dallas's Landing as an opportunity for further study. They recognized it as um, perhaps the only military action in Cumberland County during the Revolutionary War. Um, it, and they wanted to uh, try to determine exactly what had happened there. Uh, in January 2013, the commission applied to the National Park Service. July, we heard that we received the award. We were one of only 24 award recipients in the entire nation in uh, 2013. Uh, from August to December, we did paperwork. It's the federal government, so there was a lot of paperwork. Uh, February, the commission appointed a steering committee for the project, and I will, uh, in a separate slide, I'll show you who's on that. Uh, in May, an RFP was created for consultant services for the archaeology. And in June, the RFP was released to the public. And August, Hunter Research Incorporated was awarded the consultant contract by the freeholder board. And September, uh, staff from Hunter Research came to the Cultural and Heritage Commission. We had our initial uh, in-house meeting, and then we discussed how to begin the project and move forward. And of course, now in November 2014, we're all here tonight. So who is involved? Uh, the Cultural and Heritage Commission members, you can see uh, the Dallas Landing Steering Committee is comprised of uh, Penny, Merle, and Maria from the Commission, and also Mayor Sarfati and Mayor Moore uh, from Mars River and Commercial Township, Dominic Capaldi, Rachel Cobb, Megan Wren, and Rachel from the Bayshore Center. 
Um, there are other people who uh, are playing a role as well, um, and the list, the contact list, tends to get bigger and bigger, um, and that's great. We want that to happen, but this is the core group of the steering committee. And then we also created a panel of scholars um, who will work on uh, ensuring that the interpretation of the site is done in an accurate way. And so the panel of scholars includes Dr. Richard Hunter from Hunter Research, Captain Joshua Silver from West Point Academy, and Michael Adelberg, who is a uh, lo uh, independent historian specializing in New Jersey Revolutionary War history. So um, just my thoughts uh, as we move forward here. Uh, the project must be completed by August of 2015 for the grant agreement. So we are using August 2015 as the drop dead completion date for this phase of the project. Uh, there will be a second meeting and we are tentatively looking at the summer of 2015. That meeting will occur um, when the archaeology has been completed and when the final report has been drafted but not finalized. So there will be a meeting that will describe all of the findings and then uh, make recommendations on the report, but it would also allow the community to provide input before the final product is finished. And there is a plan to include a public education component at the site um, for uh, school age children and adults. Um, we have yet to plan that in any detail. Um, but there will be some type of archaeological education component uh, in Port Norris in the spring. Uh, there are sign-up sheets uh, at the front when you came in. If you did not sign up and you want to be kept apprised of everything that happens in the project, please do sign one of those books. Um, and this is this is the beginning of an ongoing process. So it's been really fascinating to, to the commission and to me that um, as we've discussed this project and as we've discussed this battle, other, other uh, actions have been raised. So they've said, we've heard things about what has happened in Hopewell or what might have happened in Hopewell. There might have been some things related to the War of 1812. There is definitely a history here that is somewhat undocumented. And so if you are aware of anything that related to uh, military action in the Revolutionary War, or the Battle of 1812, even if it's just lore at this point, um, we'd be interested to hear about it uh, because this may be the first of several uh, deeper investigations into what happened uh, in Cumberland County during that time. And um, with that, I would encourage you to visit the Cultural and Heritage Commission website, uh, cculturalheritage.org. We will be creating an independent page on there for this project, which will have all of the reports on them. Um, you, you, most of you have, and there are uh, copies at the front table. The research design report completed by Hunter Research um, which goes into the details of the documentary research so far, and Richard will talk more about that in a minute. Um, also, if you have not liked the commission on Facebook or are not following us on Twitter, um, please do so, uh, because th we use those social media sites to advance um, our programming and to get the marketing out. So if you really want to be kept up to date on everything we're doing, uh, follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and that is it, and I will pass the uh, microphone to Richard, and then after Richard is done, both he and I will be up here and we can field any questions you have. All right, so if Richard is ready. Oh, hi Richard, come on up. First of all, it's uh, really nice to be down here. Um, Cumberland County is very underappreciated. That's uh, just delightful to be here. So if you're, if you're interested in history, which I'm assuming you all are, interested in military history, Revolutionary War history, and you like a really good puzzle, this is the project for you. It really is. It's um, a very challenging puzzle. 
First off, I, I have a few preliminary remarks before we get into the uh, images here. So, the Battle of Dallas Landing. I, I want to be sure that we're all on the same page here when we use the term battle. <clears throat> this is not a pitched battle with massed armies confronting one another. This is a brief, fast-moving encounter that we're dealing with here. It's a couple of boats on the river, by most accounts a couple of shallops, uh, by some a shallop and a barge, and there's some stalking in the marshes going on, and there's a conflict that's probably over in a matter of minutes. So this is maybe not what you might think of as a battle, perhaps. There's a small number of people involved, probably 25 or less, uh, an even smaller number of casualties. It's unclear exactly how many. It's probably fairer to actually call it a skirmish or a violent incident, but uh, we're going to call it a battle. I think it's, we, we need to call it a battle. Right, Matt? Yeah. yeah. All right. So it, that, that's the first thing, the whole battle issue. The, the second thing is before we uh, get into the, uh, the facts of the matter here, and the fair bit of fiction as well probably, um, what you hear this evening, what you read this evening, you must, you absolutely must consider it all with a critical and a skeptical ear and eye. So take everything that may be presented to you as fact with a healthy pinch of salt. So the, the, the primary goal here is to get at the truth of what actually happened here on the Morris River back in August of 1781. And this is, this is where you all come in here. We've scoured all the documents that we can get our hands on. We've assembled some new information, not a lot. But to be perfectly honest, we don't have very much to go on. And what we hope tonight is to flush out from the local community, from all you guys, some well-founded, believable family stories about the battle, if they're, if they're known, and perhaps a new document or two, if they exist, maybe even an artifact, if we're lucky, that we might be able to actually associate with the battle. So that's kind of why I'm up here. So let's um, start with uh, what we think we know about the battle. Can I have the next slide, please? We have just uh, one contemporary report of what happened. This was written a few days after the event. It's a paragraph, a single paragraph in the Philadelphia papers, and the same report appeared a week, week or so later in the New Jersey Gazette, exact same report. And this is such a key item that I'm going to uh, read the whole thing in full, if I may. So Philadelphia, that's where the article is written. August 29th, that's when this article was written. Last week, seven refugees were brought to town from New Jersey. They were taken a few days before near the bridge in Morris's River by some of the Jersey militia in the shallop, which they attempted to board when a sharp contest ensued during which four of the refugees were killed and four wounded when the rest submitted. There were 15 in all, and it is said the captain who was very badly wounded, called out that he would give no quarters, which occasioned the action to become desperate. Providentially, one of the militia received only a slight wound. So, no names. Fifteen of the enemy, presumably on a boat. Four killed, four wounded, seven taken to Philadelphia. We don't know how many militia were involved or who they were. We don't know exactly where this happened. That phrase, near the bridge in Morris's river, that's Millville. Did this happen way up river? Probably not, based on the evidence of all the other accounts that we have. The most likely scenario, just based on this, is that the action occurred downriver around Dallas's landing, which, which is Port Norris, and that the captives were taken upriver by boat to the bridge and then by road to Philadelphia. So it's not very much to go on. But that's all that was written at the time. Next one, please. 
So now we're going to uh, fast forward 65 years, two generations. The next written account of the battle occurs in a book. It's uh, called The Historical Collections of New Jersey by Barber and Howe. It's a sort of standard book on the history of New Jersey that was written at the time in 1845. So this, uh, first of all, it misrepresents the original newspaper account and it also adds some other questionable information. It says uh, seven were killed. It introduces the figure of Captain James Riggins and it also sets down some additional particulars, the beginnings of an oral tradition. So I'm going to read this one out as well, if you don't mind. I won't read every single slide, I promise you. So. All right, so I'm starting with the quotations there. And this is them saying what that newspaper article said, and they got it wrong. Last week, seven refugees were brought to town from New Jersey. That's okay. They were taken in Morris River a few days before by a few Jersey militia commanded by Captain James Riggins. The militia were in a shallop which the refugees attempted to board when a sharp contest ensued, during which seven of the refugees were killed when the rest submitted. There were 15 in all, and it is said their captain called out that he would give no quarter, which occasioned the action to become desperate. So it's similar, but it's not exactly the same, and there's some important differences in there, and we've got now got an A. Let me just go on. The following additional particulars of this event are derived from Mr. Thomas Beasley of Cape May, then a boy and a witness of the action. The brunt of the fight was sustained by Captain Riggins and John Peterson, several of the militia having at the commencement jumped overboard and swam ashore, while others sneaked into the cabin. Riggins killed four or five of the enemy on their attempting to board. He fired his musket twice and then made such good use of the breach that at the end of the contest there was little left besides the barrel. Peterson was wounded by one of the refugees, who thereupon was about finishing him by cleaving his head open with an uplifted broadsword when his little son shot the man dead. Every, every refugee not killed was wounded and some desperately. A boy only escaped, and the fox, which was brought on board the day previous by one of the slain who had joined them at the mouth of the river. There were a number of fowls on board, all of which were killed. The brave Captain Riggins lived to a good old age, having died only a few years since. So that, that was somebody talking in the early 1840s about this event. So we have some new names here. We have Thomas Beasley, the informant. We have Riggins. And we have John Peterson. And I'll come back to Captain Riggins in a moment. So after this, after the 1840s, Numerous other accounts of the battle appear in the historical record down pretty much to the present day. All except for one seem to be based on the Barber and Howe account of 1845, this account. And these later accounts include those published in the, uh, in the Centennial History by uh, Cushing and Shepard and by uh, Louise Mintz and by Herbert Vanneman. Those are more recent historians. Next one, please, Matt. So we have uh, one account, however, that's rather different from, these other, from all of these others, and it's much longer, published in 1863, more than 80 years after the event, and it presents uh, a fair bit of new information quite vividly and introduces some new people. Uh, we have Lazarus Riggins, possibly the father or uncle of James Riggins, we have Lieutenant William Peterson, later a judge, and Dr. John T. Hampton, who was a local doctor from Cedarville who tended the wounded. Oddly enough, this account appears in a Milwaukee newspaper and doesn't obviously draw on the Barber and Howe account that I read a moment ago. Why on earth would this appear in a Wisconsin newspaper of all places? And we don't know the answer to this. But one wonders if it's perhaps maybe a Peterson family member, a Peterson family oral tradition moving from Cumberland County to the upper Midwest as part of the 19th century westward Scandinavian migration, who's the source of this. We don't know. And I talked about pinches of salt. 
take one right there. I, I'm not going to read this, uh, and it's, this is just a part of the, the newspaper account. It, it's in the uh, handout if you uh, pick one up when you came in. It's, it's actually a kind of entertaining. It reads rather like a sort of uh, boy's own adventure story, if you're familiar with those. So next one, please, Matt. So here's the names of the people who we have connected to the battle in the written record, all coming from secondary sources more than 60 years after the event. So we have seven local people and no enemy loyalists. James Riggins and John Peterson are the two people most often associated with the battle. William Peterson was present at the battle based on that 1863 Milwaukee account. Beasley was a witness, not really a participant. And Lazarus Riggins, John Hampton, and Jonathan Dallas, they're all kind of on the fringes of the action. They're not actually really engaged in the battle, at least from what we're reading. Next one, please. So now, here's an interesting little problem here. James Riggins. And we've researched the hell out of him. And in fact, we've been able to find several fairly useful snippets of uh, archival information. As a Cumberland County militiaman who lived to the ripe old age of 80, he actually has a Revolutionary War pension record. And this states in some detail what he did during the war. And he fought gallantly at the battles of Princeton, uh, Trenton, uh, Red Bank, and he was quite the hellraiser by the sounds of it. Uh, quite the sort of character that maybe Brad Pitt might have uh, played the part of in some uh, war movie. <clears throat> but rather inconveniently, he seems to have been holed up on a British prison ship in New York Harbor at the time the Battle of Dallas Landing actually took place. So let me just read to you this excerpt at the bottom. This is from his war pension record. It tells you uh, pretty much what he was doing. After he was discharged from the service and returning home in the vessel from Philadelphia, when sailing down the Delaware Bay, the vessel was captured by the British sloop of war, Fair American, a vessel taken from the Americans. He was taken by the British and put and confined in the prison ship Old Jersey in the month of April 1781 and was kept prisoner on board the prison ship until the 24th of January, 1782, when he got his release after enduring great hardships and much suffering and distress. So, in August of 1781, when the battle occurred, James Riggins, a private at the time, was enduring great hardship and much suffering and distress in New York Harbor. He wasn't here in Cumberland County. And I think this is, this is solid, verifiable information. When you filed for a, uh, a war pension after the Revolutionary War, you had to uh, spell out in great detail what you did during the war, and it had to get verified by the military for you to receive that pension. So there's n absolutely no reason uh, to disbelieve this. So what do, what do we make of this? Maybe there was another James Riggins? We've not had any luck uh, finding one. And interestingly, James Riggins' obituary, which was published in 1836, does talk about his war record a little bit, but it doesn't make any mention at all of, the, of this incident at uh, Dallas Landing, uh, the, the matter of him being a private. We think uh, Private James Riggins probably acquired the title of captain at some point after the war, probably meaning a, a ship's captain at this point, uh, as opposed to a captain in the militia. So maybe was there another Riggins family member, possibly Lazarus, actually the hero of Dallas Landing? We just don't know. The story of the battle, we suspect, has become embellished over time. And we have to be very, very careful here squeezing out the truth. If there are strong oral traditions still around within the Riggins family, within the Peterson family, those two families in particular, we would really, really like to hear, hear these. Next one, please. There's one other interesting uh, wrinkle to the story here. Uh, Herbert uh, Vanneman, who was a fairly well-known local historian, many, many of you probably heard of him. Uh, in the 1970s, in his book, he states that in the 1880s or thereabouts, 
John Ogden dug up some of the casualties of the battle. We found nothing further about this, nothing at all. And if anybody can throw any light on this, we would dearly like to hear about that as well. We think uh, John Ogden may actually have been John Ogden Burt, that's a, a different person, so we may not even have the right name there. Next one, please. <clears throat> so aside from uh, documents and newspapers, another key source for us uh, in understanding where the battle may have taken place is historic maps. And I, I'm just going to quickly run through the available maps that we've been able to find that show uh, some detail of the river. <clears throat> and they're all much later than the Revolution. The earliest is the one on the left here, the Watson map, which you can see actually uh, at the bottom there marks uh, Dallas's ferry. The one on the right, the Gordon map of 1833, the, the circle again shows you where Dallas Landing is, uh, shows that the road, uh, you know, there's a ferry across the river with a road on both sides of the river. It's a confirmation that there was a road there. Next one, please. This is a map uh, just a little bit later, 1842. These are wonderfully detailed coast survey maps. Uh, now Port Norris is pretty well established as its uh, own place. <clears throat> and uh, you, you can see there's a wharf on the uh, Port Norris side of the river there. No road on the, on the opposite side, which is interesting. Next one, please. <clears throat> on the uh, left here, we, these are two maps from the 1870s. Uh, you, you'll see that there is a uh, line right here, which uh, says, uh, laid out road not used. That shows you where the road used to be uh, going through the marsh there on the east side of the river. Uh, this, this map on the lower right I put up mainly because uh, We've got Wiggins Ditch way down here, have Wiggins Landing way up here. So that, that this, we're certainly a little confused and a little nervous about the Wigginses and the Rigginses. Maybe the Rigginses at one point were spelling their name with a W, a W-R-I-G-G-I-N-S. So there's lots of little odd little things like that that we need to get straightened out. Names do uh, mutate over time. Next one, please. And then uh, aerial photos. These can be very, very useful in trying to reconstruct old landscapes, especially those from earlier in the 20th century. So this is a 1930 aerial before the, the large-scale land alteration, before really major dredging and flood control projects, and the more recent sea level rise that we've had a lot of in the Delaware Bay here. And you can see from this that the meadows on either side of the river are all ditched and, uh, and cultivated. It's uh, interesting to see how different that is from today. And you can also see there's a very faint line here of that, uh, that road is coming right through in here. And the wharf would have been over in here. Next one, please. So analyzing uh, maps and aerials is, is helpful to us in trying to understand what the river valley might have looked like in the 1780s and where the patches of fast land and riverside docking points were located. So that's an uh, important part of what we're in the process of doing. So next one, please. So I want to spend the, the, the final few minutes just um, explaining what we're doing in trying to uh, pin down the battle site. We've got these four uh, main categories of activity here, documentary research, oral history, landscape analysis, archaeology. I'll, just, I'll go through each of those. So, in, so far as the documentary research is concerned, we, we've actually done most of this at this point, probably like 90% of it or so we think we've done. We've looked at uh, all the primary archival materials we can get our hands on, uh, military records, land records, those kinds of things. We've looked at a lot of genealogical information, and uh, the ma that's a particularly an area where Petersons and Rigginses may be able to help us here is the maybe genealogical information that will help us understand who these people are and how they relate to one another. But we've started to do that. A lot of that you do online. Um, newspapers, we've been looking at those. And published secondary sources, that's so books and articles and things. We've looked at a lot of those. 
So we're pretty much done. We've just got a few uh, loose ends at this point. So the, the next thing, oral history, bottom left there, this is what we're starting to do right here, right now. And uh, so this public outreach meeting is the beginning of that. And our hope is that we will find people to interview who are prepared to be interviewed, who can help us here. And uh, people may be able to produce artifacts that they've picked up uh, around the Port Norris area that may perhaps relate to the battle. That's, it's kind of a long shot, that, but we're, we remain hopeful. So um, the upper right, landscape analysis. And we're also just in the sort of early stages of this at the moment. We've gathered the, most of the maps we can get a hold of and the aerial photos. And we're looking very carefully at uh, particularly the drainage and how this may have changed. Uh, the shoreline, for example, the marshland, how that's evolved over time, the meadow, the upland. So that's all important aspects, aspects of the landscape that we're trying to reconstruct and get back to what the landscape looked like in the 1780s. And we're also uh, doing this thing, uh, cocoa analysis, it's a kind of military terrain analysis. Next slide, please. So this, this is a uh, system of military terrain analysis that the National Park Service applies to uh, battlefield sites. And it's usually best suited to uh, big on-land sites where armies are ranged against one another. So places like Gettysburg, which is what we're talking about here, showing the image of. Um, the, the key elements of this analysis are shown in the bottom of the slide. Uh, key terrain, uh, key terrain, the K for key, gives you the K of Kokoa. So the red highlighted letters are where the Kokoa comes from. Obstacles, uh, cover and concealment, uh, terrain providing observation, and avenues of approach. So the, these are aspects of battles that we will be looking at in relation to this particular incident on the Morris River and trying to apply this system of analysis. It's going to be quite difficult to do, to be perfectly honest. So it, it's, um, the battlefield here is a couple of boats on a river. Uh, there's not a lot of gunfire involved. Uh, neither of the boats was sunk that we know of. Um, the possibility of the burials kind of gives us some different uh, key terrain to explore. Uh, we'll just have to see how far we can go with all these other elements here, the obstacles, the cover and concealment, the terrain providing observation. It's a horrible acronym. It's probably one of the federal government's worst acronyms, I think. <laughs> Terrible. Anyway, it, it's, it's uh, especially tricky when we're not 100% sure here of even where on the river this incident happened. And next one, please. So going back to this, uh, to the last of the uh, investigative approaches, the archaeology, uh, which we have not started yet, and we will be doing um, over the next few months. So at some point, working around the weather and working around the tides in particular, we anticipate doing some carefully targeted archaeology. Now, this will begin with some survey work on foot, where it's possible to do it on foot, and by boat. I think probably quite a lot of it's going to end up being done by boat, depending on tides particularly. We will follow that up with some limited metal detecting. Um, and also some ground penetrating radar work. And then we will, based on the outcome of those approaches, we will hopefully get into some actual field testing. Again, we, that's the, like the last piece of this, that when you've narrowed it down to places where you think you might actually find something, we will go out and actually put a shovel in the ground. Next one, please. So uh, we, we need your help here in, in planning the archaeology. I mean, it's, it's going to be helpful to us if people have had finds of 18th century artifacts on their property in the Port Norris area on either bank of the Morris River. We'd like to hear about that. We really would. We're focusing our work for the most part within the red box there, um, which is quite a confined area on the two banks, but we will be going somewhat beyond that, uh, up onto the, uh, the upland terrace on the west side particularly. So you can expect to uh, perhaps see us out there over the next few months doing this. So next, next slide please. And so to finish up, 
This is to try and get you all involved here. I think most of you have signed in, which we really do appreciate that. It's important that we know who's here. Um, <coughs> you've had your public presentation, your first one. I think we're supposed to do this twice, Matt. Um, uh, now we're going to enter into this, uh, this sort of consultation and interview process. And I'd just like to introduce the three people who are with me today. Uh, Bill Liebknecht, who's uh, the artifact guy. So if you have artifacts, please approach Bill. He'll be behind the screen doing all kinds of indecent things. Um, Alison is a historian, and she is going to be in the room across the corridor there with all the trophies, um, speaking with families who may have family stories. And I, you, know, we, you may think that you don't have a story to tell, but I'm willing to bet that you do. And we, Alison will be pleased to hear from you. And Patrick in the, in the back there is going to sort of be with me and we will just kind of get in everybody's way. Uh, we, we, we'll kind of try and shepherd people to either Bill or to Allison or to Matt and uh, you know, just sort of generally have things run smoothly. So that's kind of where we are, Matt, if you want to come up and uh, we can respond to questions. If anyone has any questions on the process, on what's going to happen moving forward, that would be, uh, now would be a great time to have that discussion. Um, also, if you do have artifacts or if you do have a story or a document related to uh, something that may have related to this event, please uh, sign up at the front table. And what we will do is when we're done with the Q&A, I will come up here and I will uh, read the first name off the list. And that person in artifacts will go to Bill and the oral history will go to Allison. And then when, when Allison and Bill are available again, I will come back up here and, and give another name um, and we'll go through that process. Um, and we're really hoping that, uh, uh, as you could see uh, in the research, yes, a lot has been found, but a lot still needs to be uncovered. Um, and we're hoping that you can really help us with that tonight and moving forward. So with that, let's start with questions. Yes. Uh, what is it you hope to find with the ground penetrating radar? That would be your. Do you want to have a go with that, Bill? <laughs> I, again, it wasn't in the in the original uh, newspaper article, but later accounts say that they were buried on the banks of, of the river there. So one of the things we need to take a look at is where where was the bank then? Where is the bank now? Have we lost any? And when you look at a lot of the historic aerials it really doesn't look like on the west side that there's been too much loss. So we're kind of hoping that, in, that if, if you were going to bury somebody, you'd put them in the upland a little bit. And so the, the upland part of that field looks like it still may be intact. And we're kind of hoping that the ground penetrating radar might show uh, uh, shafts, grave shafts in that area. So that's the kind of thing we're, we're anticipating. All right, thank you. How deep will the radar go? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a variable technique. You can look at different depths in different levels of detail. So, I mean, you can go, uh, you, you can go three feet, you can go ten feet. So, A lot of times what they do, when they, when they do these surveys, they do them in, in time slices, they call them. And so you'll, you'll get a look here, you'll get a look there, and, and look. And so they're, they're trying to see if there's any disruptions. And if a, if a field's been plowed, and if originally a grave shaft is cut this way, and now it's been plowed, you're not going to see it in the upper 12 inches, but you might see it below. That's why they look at them in different slices. Yeah. If uh, somebody should have some artifacts of the area, will they lose them? No. You... No, not Absolutely at all. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, all we, all we want to do is, is take a look at them uh, with your permission, if, of course, if, with your permission. If we'd like to photograph them, that's all, and document them so that we can get a better understanding of, of what happened. Key thing is where they've come from. If, if you know where you found them, that's, that's the information we really need. We have a big map back here and a, and a Sharpie, and all we're really asking you to do is put your mark on there and say, this is where I found this along the, the meadow when I was trapping muskrats, or when I was duck hunting, I found this over here. And those things could be, you know, we don't physically want them, we just want to take a photograph of them, and write down your contact information, so we may say, hey, can you take us out to that spot, or, you know, that kind of thing. Other questions? Yes. 
the uh, only aerial that you showed the square box in red? How did you determine that area at this time? And also, like, how much area is that? That box is about 40 acres. And we needed to create a project area for the grant application. And so we just, we knew that Dallas's Landing was prox approximately at the end of 553. So we created a 40 acre block at the end of 553. It is possible that that block does not contain the actual location of the battle. And that's, that is something hopefully that we will refine as we move forward in the process. You certainly can't, you can't metal detect or ground penetrate radar 40 acres. So we've got to zero in in a better way um, on exactly where we need to concentrate our efforts. Yeah, we just, and you, you, you also, you, you, you can't metal detect or ground penetrating radar in the river. In the river. Um, right. So we will actually be looking probably for sonar data. We're aware of uh, studies being done in the river recently. Um, it's, I think it's pretty unlikely that the shipwrecks that we're, we're dealing with here, but uh, you know, there's th th that's another form of remote sensing data that we'll probably look at. Other questions? Yes. One thing you want to keep in mind is that when an oyster boat was ready to be scrapped, they just randomly pulled them up to help hold the banks in for the salt hay farmers, and you're going to be running into Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, the remains of that. And also, mm, the area that you're indicating that you're going to be doing metal detecting in Port Norris down in the peak of the moon area, what we call peak mm -hmm. of the moon, there was a shipyard there in the 18s. Right. So you may very well be encountering nails and right. spikes and all sorts of things in that area. Yep, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Uh, if you look on your map, half a reach up in Leesburg was a cemetery that got washed out and cleaned by the river. So the burials could have happened there. You used to be able to identify it by something large. Can you show us that on a aerial photo? That, not not, not right the second, now, but, but uh, yeah, afterwards that would be really helpful to know where that is. We, we do have another big aerial in the trophy room. So when you talk to Allison, I think you can mark that again on it with a Sharpie on the map, so that'll, that'll help us out a lot. We appreciate that. Any questions from this side of the room? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so thank you everyone, and um, feel free now, this, uh, this is going to be a process uh, to, to collect everything from you guys. So um, please be patient with us as we work through this. There is plenty of food uh, to keep you occupied. And um, as Richard said, we will be milling around. Uh, so if you want to grab us as, as Allison and Bill are doing their work with the individuals, that's fine. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. And if you signed in, you will be getting regular updates from the Cultural and Heritage Commission on how this project moves forward. Right, so thank you and thank Richard and his team for uh, doing this project with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>